In addition to praying the rosary on the five first Saturdays of the month and making the communion of reparation, Our Lady has asked us to keep her company for 15 minutes, meditating upon one of the mysteries contained in her Holy Rosary. Today we join her in contemplating the agony of our Lord in the garden. It is night. The disciples are leaving the supper room with our Lord. They're singing the Psalms as they walk through the streets of Jerusalem. Some of the holy women approach our Lord to inform him that they have heard of the betrayal, that they have heard that our Lord is now wanted, being hunted by the priests and their soldiers. Our Lord, with courtesy, responds to them, but continues on his way. He is going to the Garden of Gethsemane. This was a place he frequently went to with his disciples, where he performed all-night vigils of prayer. On this dark night, that is where he is going. The disciples are filled with enthusiasm. The blessed sacrament still present inside of them. They tell the Lord that they will never disown him, that they will remain faithful to him forever. Our Lord corrects them as they walk solemnly up the mountain to the garden of Gethsemane and within it, to the olive groves. It is about 9 p.m. when they reach the garden. Our Lord has grown sorrowful and sad. He instructs most of his disciples to remain there at the entrance to the garden. He goes up with Peter, James, and John the Beloved. When they have reached the olive groves, the Garden of Olives, at the top of the mountain, our Lord tells them that he must separate, that he will pray on his own. He goes off into the part of the garden which is full of wild olive trees, an unkept area of the garden where the weeds are growing, where the rocks are jagged. And there he throws himself upon the ground in prayer. Blessed Mother, in spirit you are united with your son. Saint Bridget of Sweden even tells us that you approached somewhat towards that area and that you were able to see your son, our Lord, with the sweat of blood on his forehead, that you saw him sorrowful, that you saw him in that agony, and that you in your own soul experienced something of that agony. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, She was given a vision of this dark evening. She tells us, When Jesus left the apostles, I saw a great number of frightful figures surrounding him in an ever-narrowing circle. His sorrow and anguish increased. He withdrew tremblingly into the back of a little cave, like one seeking shelter from a violent tempest, and there he prayed. I saw the awful visions following him into the grotto and becoming ever more and more distinct. Ah, it was as if that narrow cave encompassed the horrible, the agonizing vision of all sins with their delights and their punishments. All sins committed from the fall of our first parents 
until the end of the world. All sins. The Lord Jesus saw all sins. He saw my sins. I am there in that horrific vision. That vision which encompasses the heresies that have afflicted the Catholic Church, the wicked popes, the fallen priests, the heresies, the blasphemies, the most evil secret sins committed by men, and above all, the secret sins that I have committed. O oh Lord Jesus, in the garden, I was there in that horrific vision. And you saw all of my sins. And why did you see them? You saw them because you were to take ownership of them. That is, you were pledging at that moment to offer a sacrifice for those sins as if they were your own, as if you were the one who had committed them. Yes, in that vision, in that garden, you pledge to offer satisfaction for the sins of humanity. You took ownership of sins so that you could offer before your father an act of love and reparation and sorrow for those sins as if you had committed them. What horror! Our Lord taking my sins upon him. What horror! Lord Jesus, I see you overwhelmed with my sins. I weep for my sins, knowing that in the garden you chose to take my sins upon yourself. And there is Satan. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich informs us that he was there like the most cunning of all Pharisees, saying, how can you possibly take those sins upon yourself? It is too much. It is too heavy. There, that evil Satan tried to accuse our Lord of sin. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich writes, he reproached Jesus with causing Herod's massacre of the Holy Innocents with exposing his parents to want and danger in Egypt, with not having rescued St. John the Baptist from death, with bringing about disunion in many families, with having protected degraded people, refusing to cure certain sick persons, with injuring the Gergesians by permitting the possessed to overturn their vats and their swine to rush into the sea. He accused him of the guilt of Mary Magdalene, since he had not prevented her relapse into sin, of neglecting his own family, of squandering the good of others. In one word, all that the tempter would at the hour of death have brought to bear upon any ordinary mortal. Our Lord is attacked, and above all, he is attacked by Satan as he says, what good is all this for? In spite of your agony and passion, the great majority of mankind will be damned. Throughout the ages, you will be rejected. The blessed sacrament will be trampled upon. Nuns will flee convents. Priests will abandon their vows. Lay faithful will destroy their marriages. Will abandon you for very trivial matters. So many will be lost. But our Lord does not despair. He is divine. Instead, he embraces the sin. That is, he embraces the responsibility of being the one who will satisfy for these sins before his father. Our Lady is contemplating this from afar. She has returned back to the upper room and there she undergoes her own agony as she experiences something of that which is going through 
in the soul of her beloved son. The heart of the mother is so united to that of the son that she feels this. Indeed, any holy Catholic, any holy Catholic can experience a taste of that chalice that our Lord drinks from as he sees the panorama of sin, as he detests the sins of the world, and as he chooses to offer an act of sorrow and reparation for those sins as the leader of humanity. Blessed Mother tastes it. She keeps our Lord company, even though his disciples have fallen asleep. She is there, praying, keeping company with him, as we are in this decade of the Holy Rosary. In this decade, I pledge myself to a life of reparation, a life sharing in our Lord's sentiments of horror towards sin, of love of the good, of desire to follow the Father's will, even when it is not pleasant to the flesh, even when the flesh rightly rebels against it. In this mystery, I pledge myself to say, Thy will be done, O Lord, Thy will be done, Father. In this mystery, I pledge to make up for sin, to offer acts of love and sacrifice for sin, united to our Lord's perfect sacrifice of the cross. I think of Saint Margaret Mary, to whom our Lord exposed his sacred heart and asked her to make a holy hour of reparation every Thursday night going into Friday morning to keep him company in his agony. And indeed, in the vision of St. Luke's Gospel, an angel appears to our Lord in that garden and comforts him. That angel presents to our Lord all those chosen souls who would keep him company, who would unite with him in this agony. Our Lord saw the panorama of sin Yes, but then he also saw those chosen souls, those holy souls who keep him company, who make acts of sorrow for sin, who share in his sentiments, those true children of Mary who keep him company in this sorrowful mystery. But now Our Lady's heart beats more vigorously. Something has happened. Yes, she knows that the soldiers have arrived, carrying torches and weapons. They approach our Lord. He calls his disciples and says, Rise, let us go to meet my accusers. Whom do you seek? I am he. They fall to the ground at the word of Almighty God, the one who created the heavens and earth with that word. They fall to the ground, acknowledging his divinity, even as they seize him. The disciples begin to resist. St. Peter cuts the ear of Malchus, but our Lord warns him to put down the sword. If he wanted to, he could call legions of angels at this moment. But he has embraced his mission. Indeed, on coming into the world, he embraced this mission. This is why he came, to take on the sins of humanity, to offer a perfect sacrifice for them. With love, he receives the kiss of Judas, his friend. Alas, too many times that has been my kiss when I've betrayed our Lord for such trivial earthly delights. Indeed, perhaps I made the worst of all kisses to him in receiving him in holy communion while in mortal sin. 
Now I can only make reparation for those times and to console our Lord for the times this has occurred. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I wish to unite with the sentiments of your blessed mother who makes reparation for these horrible outrages committed against you in the blessed sacrament. As you are taken by the soldiers, I pledge to accompany you. I pledge that my entire life will be a life following you wherever you lead me, knowing that ultimately you will lead me to my death, because every human life must end in death, must end in a uniting itself with your cross, with your passion. Arise, let us go hence. Jesus, I will follow you wherever you wish me to go. Blessed Mother, help me as I try to follow our Lord, as I wish to make acts of love and reparation such as you made on that night as our Lord experienced the agony in the garden. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.